Hey there, everyone. Mike Maybach with KTVU Fox 2 in the San Francisco Bay Area talking about uh, COVID-19 and its connection possibly here to vaping, specifically among teenagers and young adults. And to discuss this, uh, we're lucky enough to have Dr. Uh, Bonnie halpern felcher with us, uh, the professor of pediatrics uh, in the Division of Adolescent Medicine there at the Stanford uh, School of Medicine. Uh, you're the senior author of a new study, uh, Dr. Uh, tied to this. Tell me just kind of on a... On, if you had a headline in a newspaper, what would that headline be for that study? Absolutely. Well, thank you for having me on. Uh, the, there are two headlines. One is if you are an adolescent young adult between the ages of 13 and 24 and you have ever used an e-cigarette, you are five times more likely to be diagnosed with COVID-19. More importantly, if you've used in the past 30 days an e-cigarette and cigarettes, so dual users, and we can talk about what that means, you are 6.8, almost seven times more likely to be diagnosed with COVID-19. My goodness, I was thinking maybe two to three times, but when you say something like five to seven times, even as a professional yourself, someone who's been doing this for your life, for your career, was that surprising? Was that a big number? It was a huge number, I'll yeah. admit. Uh, you know, other studies with adults looking predominantly at cigarettes have found about a two, two and a half fold increase. So to see this number, it was extremely unexpected and, and it is, it's very large. How was the data collected, if you don't mind me asking here? No, of course not. So it is uh, really the first national population-based study that we have. So we did a survey, anonymous survey, of 4,300 youth and young adults across the country using Qualtrics panel. So it's an existing panel of participants who then received the survey and answer it. Okay. And... Um... You know, my concern before this pandemic was was vaping. I've done stories on vaping, on flavored e-cigarettes. Um, when you when you look at the results here, and I, well, let me back up here. Let me just ask you: are, Did you find that more people who are vaping from the pandemic, or these are individuals who had been vaping prior to the pandemic? So that's a good question, and uh, we actually um, can't give all that information because some of those results are still pending. Okay. But um, so I will say that in this study, we didn't really look in this particular paper. We did not look at or include what their habits were or whether they went up or down. But we do know that these are people who were vaping during the epidemic because we asked about in May, the data were collected in May, and we asked about past 30 days. So that would have been squarely in the, you know, towards the beginning, a little bit, a couple months into the pandemic. So they were definitely people who were vaping at that time. Okay, so, and again, when you look at uh, COVID-19, you know, it, obviously it, it's a respiratory thing for a lot of individuals of all different ages. And there's an association between vaping, putting this, ingesting this into your body, and, and then therefore tearing down your body and making it more vulnerable uh, to a virus like the coronavirus. Absolutely. So we actually think that there are a few possible explanations for our findings. I mean, we, we, it's an epidemiological study. We don't have mechanism in it, but we think there are a few. One is exactly what you're saying. We already know vaping and smoking uh, influence your lungs and influence your immune system. So you suddenly introduce a virus to lungs that are already damaged, you're likely going to increase that damage and potentially even more likely to get the disease because you sort of re, um, don't have the resistance or the barriers to, to uh, fight off a disease. That's one hypothesis. Another just has to do with exposure. So we know that adolescents and young adults share their vaping products. We know that from my work, other publications, other people's work as well. So it, even though a lot of the participants were sheltering in place, if they're in the backyard with a couple of friends and they're sharing their devices, it's very easy to transmit and increase your exposure to virus. Also the hand to mouth, right? You may be, you could touch a doorknob, touch your device, and then touch your mouth and increase the exposure. And then the final possibility is there's been some question of whether the, either the droplets of the virus could actually go into the aerosol or be come out, you know, expired through through that big plume of aerosol, and either you're transmitting it to other people or you're breathing it in yourself. And so, you know, unlike breathing regular air, you're breathing deeply in when you're using a vaping product. So that might be part of the problem. Too. That's interesting. I didn't think about that. So yeah, you know, I would think say I would initially think that just being a smoker, right, a pack of cigarettes would be worse. <clears throat> is that is that not the case here? I mean, from what you can tell? 
Right. Well, we, we really can't tell that in our, in our study. And a lot of people have asked me, well, why are you hanging your hat so much on the e-cigarettes when really you found dual use the past 30 days? Yeah. Uses both. What it is, is that, you know, the pattern of use for most teens is either e-cigarettes and teens are initiating with e-cigarettes. They're not starting tobacco with cigarettes nowadays. That's just not happening. Mm -hmm. And most of what they're using are e-cigarettes. But a lot dabble a little bit here and there in c cigarettes. So maybe they couldn't get any cigarette or their friend had a cigarette. So when we ask them, have you ever used a cigarette or in the past 30 days, the answer is yes for a lot. So we don't think that the dual use is literally both using both at the same time. Our data actually suggests that it's really heavy e-cigarette use that we're seeing. So because of that, we can't tease out which is um, more it. or less the driving force here. Did you guys look into, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the socioeconomic aspect of this at all, or is that, was that not involved? Yeah, we did. And we actually um, included uh, age, race, ethnicity, gender. And the big finding that we found that a lot of others have found too uh, in non-tobacco studies is that if you are a minority, particularly African-American or Latino, you're also more likely to be diagnosed um, and, and to have symptoms. And, and we think that that's just get exposure independent of the tobacco use just expose your in terms of you might be in the workforce right now not able to shelter in place or in more crowded living conditions it's important to note that our vaping and, and uh, tobacco findings are independent of or what we call controlling for statistically controlling for all the demographic factors that are there though okay um you know there's been a lot of talk about just the sales of alcohol and stores have gone up since march do, did part of this study include whether or not the use of e-cigarettes have also gone up since the pandemic? Yeah, we, we yeah. do have those data. We haven't analyzed those yet, but we definitely are looking at whether use amongst adolescents is going up, remaining the same, and how patterns are changing. And also we've looked at stress, and those will be included in future papers. You know, for our viewers across the country right now, what's going on in California, there's a piece of legislation, and I'm glad I have you with me because I just learned that you testified about this uh, Senate Bill 793 going through uh, the State House right now. It would limit the sale of flavored uh, vaping products. Um, this was in the works, you know, prior. Um, but could you speak on a professional level and vape what you testify? And I'm curious what you think about this, this bill and, and uh, whether it'll make it through here. Sure. So I testified early on when it was in the Senate Health Committee um, and it passed through there. So this was probably at the very beginning of the pandemic. Uh, testified on that behalf, really focusing on flavors. We know that adolescents are using flavors. There's a question of whether they're using mint or menthol. They're clearly using mint and menthol. They're also using fruit and sweet flavors. And our research and others clearly show that if they're, that the reason why teens are using these products is because of flavors, and if they didn't have flavors, they wouldn't use them. Mm -hmm. So that is really the driving force behind e-cigarette use. And, and again, e-cigarette use is what teens are starting with. That's the you know epidemic amongst the pandemic are the e-cigarette use. So that's how I testify was really showing the importance of the flavors, how they're hooking kids. Um, where it is now, the Senate, uh, the bill is now um, going through appropriations and through the assembly side. Um, and you know, I was uh, been part of some of those workings that are going on, and you know we're very hopeful that it will be passed. No better time right now than uh, right now with a pandemic to get these e-cigarettes out of the hands of youth. And to be honest, out of the hands of everybody, e-cigarettes are not helping adults quit, but they are addicting a new generation of young people. I remember being in eighth grade, buying that first can of chewing tobacco, and it was uh, mint flavored. And there wasn't even, it was like the little bandits. And I remember putting them in and I did it for the flavor and we got this buzz and it was great. And then, you know, a year later, you know, I was, I had moved on and I wasn't getting the buzz, but I was still injecting the chewing tobacco into my mouth, you know, every day. And I, and I chewed till I was about 28 years old. So I mean, I quit now, but I understand the hook of the flavored product. And uh, I, I don't do e-cigarettes, but I understand that when it comes on a national level, the FDA, do you think they're ever going to get involved on regulation? So they're involved, um, whether it's effective and doing much is hard to say. So in January, you know, the FDA has the authority to regulate and oversee e-cigarettes, all tobacco products, and as of 2016, including e-cigarettes. In January 2020, they said that they were going to prioritize their enforcement over pod-based or cartridge-based products like Juul. 
for mm. example, and particularly those that are not tobacco or menthol. Um, and then, so what happened is, is that we get new products on the market like Puff Bar, and we still have kids who are using all of these products. So, you know, and without absolutely pulling these products off the market until we really understand what's going on with how safe they are, what's happening with the marketing, and to get them out of the hands of kids is the most important. So I don't think the FDA is doing enough. I think the FDA needs to do a lot more. Uh, as a result of our study, there was a letter from Congressman Chris Murthy to the FDA basically demanding e-cigarettes are pulled from the market during this pandemic hmm. so we don't continue to hurt our young people. Uh, they're still out there, and I'll end it with this. If you wanted to say something to parents out there who are watching, or even the youth who may be watching this, um, what, what would you tell them? Well, thank you. I would say uh, both youth and parents. I really hope that you uh, take these findings and thank you for reporting on it. Take this episode and talk to your talk to each other, talk to your uh, children, and really say, "Look, we've had many health issues around e-cigarettes. We've had Evoli, we've had asthma, we've had bronchitis, lungs collapses, seizures." Now we've got COVID that we're concerned about. It's the, really, really the time to continue or have those conversations not to use e-cigarettes or, or if you are already using to quit. Not easy to quit. You could say that yourself with nicotine. Not easy to quit these nicotine products, but it is really, really important to do so. Um, you can go, if I can say, on our yeah. toolkit. We have the Tobacco Prevention Toolkit on our website. It's a completely free set of curriculums and information. Just download and you can use it and start that conversation with your youngsters um, and with each other. What's the website? It's tobaccopreventiontoolkit.stanford.edu. Okay, yeah. Five to seven times more likely to be infected. I mean, that's, that is eye-opening um, from me, from you who did the study. So, uh, Dr. Bonnie helpner felcher thank you very much. I appreciate your time and, and thanks for doing the study. Thank you very much.